As someone who's successfully founded multiple businesses, I cannot overstate how important it is to have a single source of truth for your business, for inventory, for revenue, and on and on. There's an amazing tool called NetSuite that can help you do just that. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. Number 25, well, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. And right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There was once a time when building a website was a massive undertaking and a huge pain, something that you would need to clear your entire schedule for. Well, guess what? Those days are over, and now you can build a professional, sparkling website in just seconds, thanks to Hostinger. In fact, I recently did this, and I shared the process on my YouTube channel, and it was absolutely mind-blowing, especially considering it took like days on end previously when I first started building websites. This tool is amazing, and I was using AI to do it. So Hostinger is a top highly rated global web hosting and website creation brand, right? And all you have to do to build a website is answer three questions. Here it is. You enter your brand name, you select the website type, you describe your business, and then you can customize it further with a drag and drop editor. It's literally that simple. I just went through this process. I promise you it is the easiest way to build a website. And it also offers some AI-driven SEO-friendly copy, an AI logo maker. Plus, they make all this super affordable. It's less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name. H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash SPI. And use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. It's incredible. Now back to the show. This is the Smart Passive Income Podcast with Pat Flynn, session number 220. Here's a question. What would you wish for? Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host. When he was a kid, his favorite toy was a typewriter. Pat Flynn. Want to stop grinding through resumes and just meet your match already? Well, you can with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. It's your matching and hiring platform. With over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, plus their matching engine helps you find quality candidates fast. And it works like really fast. In fact, by the time this ad's over, 23 new hires will have been made on Indeed, according to Indeed data worldwide. It's the perfect match of speed and quality. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites and... I think Indeed is the place to go. It's easy to manage. Everything is in just one spot. The interview process, it's scalable with you and your business as it grows. Like there's no other platform you would need than Indeed. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored ad job credit to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive. Terms and conditions apply. You need to hire, you need Indeed. We entrepreneurs are at our desks a lot. So having solid equipment is super important. And a sit stand desk can make a huge difference as many folks on our team will attest to. If you haven't tried one yet, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Over a million customers have chosen Uplift Desk. Innovative product designs, reasonable pricing, same-day shipping, free accessories with every desk. You can see why they're such a big hit. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? And that covers the complete desk, by the way, not just the top or some fine print like that. Moving while you work is just healthier. And Uplift Desk provides a state-of-the-art experience. They're stable, made of very solid materials. There's over 100 desktop choices and customizations available. Just the choices for material for your desk are amazing, all the way from laminate to eco to bamboo to solid wood. If you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. 
Go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. Hey, what's up, everybody? Thank you so much for joining me today. This is a very special episode because I was so thankful to get connected with Frank Shankwitz, who is the co-founder of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. A lot of us have heard about the Make-A-Wish Foundation. You may have even seen documentaries or heard stories in and around your hometown. There was one documentary in particular that my family watched together that my son got really excited about, and this was called Bat Kid. And you may remember this story from uh, about a year ago, I believe, when uh, a kid who was uh, who was sick, he had asked to be a superhero for a day, uh, to be Batman, and the entire city of San Francisco transformed for this little boy's wish. And um, I was just, again, very thankful to get connected with Frank, who is n- no longer the CEO, but he was a co-founder and CEO, first president of the foundation. And we talk about business, uh, of course. We talk about what it takes to run a nonprofit and what it's like and how to fundraise and all that stuff. And and just Frank is a great mind, some great stories to tell also about why it got started and the whole purpose of doing this in the first place. And so I just invite you to sit back, listen. Frank, you'll hear in his voice that he's just such an authentic person. And I connected with him instantly, even though this was the first time I've ever chatted with him. And in this episode, I literally teared when I was Uh, teared up and cried while I was doing this interview. I laughed, and uh, you might just do the same. So uh, just as a warning, this is a great one. And, um, you know, I'm always looking for some new opportunities out there for philanthropic efforts, and this was very inspirational. And I do have some big things planned, which I'll share with you in the future. I don't know when, but there are big things coming, and Frank will definitely help be a catalyst for that. And here we go. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm here with Frank Shankwitz, the co-founder of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Um, He has received uh, so many awards for uh, a lot of what he's created. Uh, The President's Call to Service Award, the Making a Difference in the World, the Making a World of Difference, and the Ellis Island Medal of Honor Awards. Just, just, uh, man, just, Frank, thank you so much for being here. It's such an honor to have you on the show today. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Pat. I appreciate the invite. Absolutely. You know, I'm always trying to encourage others uh, through uh, example, but also through through having guests like you on the show to think beyond just, you know, serving our customers out there with the businesses that we have and to really think about what else we could do with a lot of the, the success that we find. And so I've been doing a lot of what I can to explore different philanthropic efforts, but uh, that's why I wanted to get you on the show to talk about kind of your uh, start here with the Make Wish Foundation. I know you're you're no longer in management there, um, and you and you're doing other things. We can get into that as well. But could you take us back to the beginning when Make a Wish started, and where where did this idea come from? How how did it all get formed? Well, let's see, we need about a three hour show for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe the, maybe the five minute rundown or something. Yeah, we'll try to, I'll try to summarize this as best that I can, Pat. Um, in, in the mid-'70s, there was a very popular television show called Chips. Yes. That was uh, very, very popular with the kids. And for people who don't, aren't aware of that, Chips was about the adventures of two California Highway Patrol motorcycle officers, uh, extremely popular with the children. Uh, in fact, the, the show featured children as often as they could. But during this time period, I was a motorcycle officer with the Arizona Highway Patrol. And, in fact, I was on a squad of 10 men that we worked the whole state of Arizona, two weeks in one town, two weeks in another. And because of the popularity of the chips, and, and our, we would always go with two-man teams in these little towns, areas, uh, because of the popularity of the show, all of a sudden the kids would just start waving at us as we were in town. They would the teachers would ask to come to the schools and talk about bicycle safety and just meet the children. It was the greatest PR tool ever for the police forces, especially for Arizona Highway Patrol. And our motorcycles, our uniforms, and everything were identical to California. In fact, we initially trained with California Highway Patrol in Sacramento, except obviously ours at Arizona. Mm-hmm. So again, the kids just loved it. But in uh, 1980, I received a phone call from a friend that was a U.S. Customs agent and said uh, he met a seven-year-old boy named Chris. Chris had terminal leukemia, only a few weeks to live, and his heroes were Punch and John from the television show Chips. And all Chris ever talked about was he would love to meet a motorcycle officer, a highway patrol motorcycle officer. 
And Tom Austin, who was a customs agent, asked us if we could do something to maybe set Tarpon and several other people a special day. It was arranged for this little boy to come to the, our headquarters building. In fact, we flew him at our uh, state police helicopter from his hospital. And I was asked to stand by to meet this little boy. I'd never met him before. Uh, helicopter landed. I expected our paramedics to help out this little boy because he's just come off IVs. Uh, like I said, extremely ill. This little bound of energy hopped out of that helicopter. When he looked over at that motorcycle, he thought he was looking at either Ponce or John from the TV show. <laughs> <laughs> and just ran up, just this big smile on his face. And his mother was with him. And I was watching her reaction, and she just got tears because she's seeing a seven-year-old boy just all of a sudden run around happy, giggling, just having the greatest time. And, and Chris went on that day to become the first and only honorary high patrol officer in the history of the Arizona High Patrol. Now we're going back almost 36 years and uh, complete with a, a uniform that was made for him, his motorcycle wings, uh, everything that this little boy could imagine. Oh. And unfortunately, he passed away a couple of days later. Our department asked me, they said, we have lost an oh, official officer. He was going to be buried in Illinois. Would you please go back with another motorcycle officer, give him a full police funeral, and uh, which we did. He was buried in uniform, his great marker reached, first gracious Arizona trooper. But flying home from Illinois, I just started thinking about this little boy who had a wish, and we made it happen. Why can't we do that for other children? And that's when the idea of the Make-A-Wish Foundation was born. And it took me six months to get it going. I finally found uh, four other people that would uh, serve as board members. And uh, we became official in November of 1980. And I was the first president and CEO at that time. Wow. You know, you were bringing me to tears right there with that story. I have a six-year-old boy. Um, and I can only imagine just uh, that situation uh, as a parent and, and what that would be like. And, you know, just if, if I find myself with my kids in that sort of situation, I, I would want to give them their, their biggest wish like that. And so I, I, I just thank you for, for sharing that. And um, when you were starting, you said it took you about six months to get it going. I think that's one of the things that a lot of us who are listening to the show, we, we have these grand ideas of, of things we could do to help others. But then the actual action that it takes to make that happen is the difficult part. And because it's difficult, a lot of us don't actually do those things. What were those six months like? You get this idea on the way home and, you know, it's obviously motivating you. What What are your first steps from there? And, and you have to remember that this was the day before Internet. <laughs> right. Right. You're absolutely right. Thank so, you for reminding us. Yeah. And, and so how do you start a nonprofit? And um, that was the research, li- uh, going to the research libraries. I fortunately had a, a friend that was an attorney, and it's not an oxymoron. Sometimes attorneys can't be friends. <laughs> <laughs> I always tease them about that. But just a lot of research. And I, I'm working full-time, and like most police officers, I'm also working off-duty jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, it just took a lot, a lot of effort. Uh, but I also started receiving a lot of help from the attorneys, from other people, how to research this, how to start it. Um, and we finally filed a 501c3 um, Again, just a lot, a lot of time. But the biggest thing, Pat, that I had a commander with the Arizona Department of Public Safety who endorsed this idea. And he came to me and he said, I know what you're doing. Uh, I'm going to allow you to use company time when you have to. He said, but I want you to give me eight hours work. If it takes you 15 hours to do that, you're going to give me an honest eight hours work. Mm -hmm. And I always admired and respected that gentleman for that and meant above and beyond to fulfill that little contract that he made with me verbally. Wow, that's great. Uh, well, well uh, thank you to him for, for allowing you to do that. Um, another thing that comes to mind is just how big Make-A-Wish is. Um, and I don't know the full history on Make-A-Wish, but when you had started it, I mean, it's one thing to to start something like this. I mean, it's, it's awesome that, that you'd done that, but then to be so big that when it is sometimes the first a uh, nonprofit that comes to people's minds um, and, and one that is uh, very much a part of the public eye. And, uh, you know, we see stories like the Bat Kids story and, you know, immediately immediately brings us to tears. And, and um, you know, they, they had that documentary. I actually watched that with my son 
a couple of weeks ago about about the bat kid who was going through San Francisco and man my son was just glued to the television I'm always trying to teach him about giving to others and that that just showed him what a whole city did really and really a whole world did to come together because of the internet and its ability to connect everybody together nowadays um, to support this one one child and you know even my son was asking me why are they doing this for this little boy because initially I think it was because he wanted stuff like that to happen to him too um and he was like well why like how are all these people coming together just for this one kid but could you speak a little bit before we even get to the marketing or the the growth of make a wish on just you know how important it is to focus even on on just one single person uh, because in entrepreneurship a lot of people are like oh how do i reach the most people's possible um but when you're trying to help others even just affecting one person's life can make a world of a difference can you can you speak on that a little bit frank well, and, and, and people care. That's the biggest thing is people care. Uh, it, it's such a strange world we're living in right now. But mm-hmm. people still care. And uh, the, the bat wish is, is the most perfect example. It just started out that this young boy wanted to, to be Batman for a day. Um, and that was simply it. But the word got out uh, through volunteers and that. And like you said, that whole city came together because that city cared about this one little boy. And that's, that's what made this foundation what it is today. People care. Um, and p- people may not know, we serve children with life-threatening medical conditions. Uh, when we started this, it was strictly with children with terminal illnesses. And through the grace of God, modern medicine, a lot of those terminal illnesses of children are now surviving today. Mm-hmm. But we still don't know if they're going to survive that condition. But back to your question, it's strictly because people care, they want to help. And if so many of the businesses get involved, uh, a business is very successful in the community. And what's the best way for a business to identify the community is to give back somehow with some type of, of a charity, with a nonprofit, with, I know, real estate companies go in and help people fix up their houses. There may be a widow situation or an elderly person, they can't do it, they'll go in clean yards, paint, whatever it is, somehow just giving back to the community, caring about people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's really what it, what it all comes down to, and every single person is, is important. Um, when it comes to the growth of Make-A-Wish, I think that obviously that caring is, is a big part of the growth of it. Um, but were were there any strategic things that happened in the in the beginning stages of, of uh, Make-A-Wish that really helped it get its footing and help, help spread the word out there? Um, were, were there any specific, uh, I don't know, moments that you can remember that were really oh, yeah, big, yeah, big lifting definitely. moments? What were they? And it, would be our, it would be our very first official wish pad. It was in 1981, March of 1981. Again, a seven-year-old little boy. Um, and his wish was to go to Disneyland. And we had very little funds, uh, nothing, but we were going to make this happen. Uh, we called and called Disney people over at Disneyland, California. They had no idea who we were. We were brand new. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of wouldn't help us out. And I started this charity based on character, integrity, accountability. And like I said, Disney just wouldn't help us. Uh, I finally called Disney, and I said I, we would call several times. I said, uh, I need to talk to you, uh, the director of public relations, but there I was on a highway patrol, and I have a warrant for one of your people. I got the man on the phone immediately, and the first thing I told him was, I lied to you. Now, remember I just said that basis <laughs> on integrity, <laughs> accountability, but I said, I lied to you. This is the reason I'm calling. Here's my name. Here's my badge number. Here's my supervisor's name. You can get me fired immediately, but please listen to my story. Wow. And told him about the Make-A-Wish Foundation, what we wanted. We just wanted to get a young boy in there. He was in a wheelchair. Could we possibly get him in front of the lines? That one little lie started the relationship with Disney, who now 36 years later has been one of the biggest sponsors of Make-A-Wish Foundation. So sometimes you gotta just lie a little bit, but <laughs> <laughs> you can. But that that was the start of the growth because Disney gave us a media press, mm-hmm. and the press picked it up right away. The Associated Press, because they had never heard of anything like this, the Make-A-Wish Foundation. There was no similar organization in the United States of the world. And then uh, NBC television picked it up, and it went on a, a nationwide broadcast, which immediately got us to press coverages. Other states started calling, how do we franchise this? How do we get a chapter in our state? We just started that growth. 
because it's just that one little event, now, all these years later, there's 63 chapters in the United States, 36 international chapters on five continents. And I always want to stress that all because of one little boy that hadn't been to that seven-year little boy, this would have never happened. Yeah, wow. But also, if you hadn't really, really wanted to talk to Disney and, and just did what it took, I think that that's that's another thing. I mean, you, you really believed in what you're doing, and you really knew that this was something that could work. And so, you know, you told a little bit of a lie. And, of course, since when, <laughs> when somebody uh, says or, or hears that they have a warrant um, on them, uh, you'll you'll talk to the person you need to talk to. But, man, what, a, what an incredible – I was literally getting goosebumps – while while you were telling that, and to think now, like you said, um, thirty six international chapters, five continents, and I'm reading here on the wiki, there's over three hundred thousand wishes worldwide that have been granted. Um, and and to think that that, I mean, that those are not just the lives of those children, but the lives of the families of those children and everybody who hears and reads those stories. I think it's it's spreading, um, just giving and uh, hope for everybody. And I and I and I love that. And I thank you again for. For, for all of that, um, you know, just, oh gosh, there's there's just so many things I want to dive into. Um, I think one of the things that, based on your experience, and I know you're not uh, working as CEO and, the fir- and president anymore, you were the first president back in the 80s, you're also still involved uh, as a, what's called a wish ambassador. Can you talk about a little bit about what, th- what that means? Uh, wish ambassador, uh, uh, the foundation has asked me to go to different chapters uh, throughout the United States over uh, in, in- as far as uh, Saipan and Guam and Kenyan, uh, on keynote speeches, keynote fundraisers, to meet and greet with uh, certain executives to explain the mission, to just mm-hmm. get that one-on-one, uh, not a telephone conversation, but an eye-to-eye, as I like to call it. As a police officer, you like to look at people's eyes, their reactions, and, and just explain what the mission is and ask for their support. And um, been very successful at it to get the support. Um, to, to make the foundation grow to what it is today. The, the current president and CEO of the National Foundation of Overseas Everything is doing just an excellent job. I mean, it takes, and if I can go back a little bit, I had to make a career choice after two years mm-hmm. of starting the foundation. Am I going to run this foundation and am I going to be a police officer? I was an excellent police officer bragging a little bit, but I knew little about the nonprofit world. It was all brand new to me. And like some of my mentors tell me, you hire the experts, and that's what we started doing. I never took a cell. We knew we had to hire the experts, and that was probably one of the best business decisions myself and the board at the time made. Let's hire these experts, and over the years, they made this grow to what it is today. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. It reminds me of Andrew Carnegie back in the Steel days where he had connected with what he called his mastermind group, and he just hired all these experts in the steel industry because he didn't know – he actually didn't know much about steel, but he was able to become uh, one of the richest men in the world and revolutionize just a lot of things um, and also become the biggest donor ever at the time, um, giving to charities and whatnot uh, in a similar fashion because of his connections and the fact that he had hired other people like you had just done uh, and, and had said. And I think I think that's very smart. And that brings me to my next question here, Frank, which is all about, you know, the business of this kind of work. I mean, it, it's it's. Uh, it's amazing that you've put you started this and and it's continuing to go and it's continuing to run. But it's also we have to realize that it's still a business and it still has to run. It still has to profit and make money so that it can continue to run and help others. I think that's a big struggle for people too. And can you talk a little bit about when you were starting it out? How you were able to keep it afloat? I think that's one of the things, especially with this kind of thing where um, you want to give so much. It's it's very hard to keep it afloat in terms of the profits that uh, you know because you need to keep it running. So what what can a person do who's looking to get into nonprofits based on your experience? What can they do to make sure that, you know, they, they continue to keep this thing moving forward, that they're, they're going to actually, um, you know, just stay afloat? Probably the one word is integrity. Um, if you're starting a nonprofit, uh, it's all about the nonprofit. It's not about you. Um, and, and what I mean on that is you've got to focus on the mission. Um, a lot of nonprofits, if you look at my favorite website is charitynavigator.org. Charity Navigator is the watchdog for nonprofits. And there are 1.2, approximately 1.2 million nonprofits in the United States right now. Wow. And a whole bunch of their own personal gain. And Charity Navigator rates on a four star system and they, they point out where the money is going because every nonprofit has to report quarterly 
to uh, Internal Revenue Service, and Charity Neighbor gets their navigator gets those reports, looks at them, and find out where the dollars that people are donating are going. Is it going to the mission? Is it going to somebody's high salary? And that was one of the biggest things that we stressed on when we started this. That's why I never took a salary um, because I wanted every dollar to go to the mission. Mm-hmm. And Make a Wish right now is maintaining a 70% or higher uh, of every dollar donated goes direct to the mission, which maintains a four star rating with Charity Navigator. It still maintains that mission. So the biggest thing if somebody's in the nonprofit world is starting, like I'm starting a brand new nonprofit here, uh, we're getting ready to launch here about next month, hopefully, is again, we're going to focus on the mission and not our individual person. Mm-hmm. Do you want to, I don't know if you're able to, but do you want to talk about what that next um, venture is for you and, and just maybe share a little bit uh, about it so we can perhaps um, you know show some support for it? Yeah, I, I mentioned to you that the Make Wish Foundation is a well-run, well-founded organization, and its mission is for the children of electric and illnesses. I meet so many people around the country because of, I'm now a motivational, inspirational speaker that talks about, well, how come we can't get somebody to help me with, uh, for instance, service dogs for autistic children? Uh, and I did research on that. It's an example of $58,000 average price to train a service dog for wow. an autistic child. Uh, the same service dogs go to our, our veterans uh, that can help them, a veteran with prosthetic limbs and that, help them get around, help them do things, the same price. And the VA doesn't uh, provide that. Just all sorts of individual causes. And a friend of mine suggested the foundation. We will try and get in the community and start a ripple effect to raise money for these individual causes. So that's, in fact, the name of the new nonprofit, Ripple Effect Foundation. And... Uh, our, our, our mission is going to create, manage, advance media and online benefits for all types of charities. And we're getting ready to launch it pretty quick. I've developed a pretty good uh, uh, board on there. Um, some names I'll mention, you won't know their name, but you'll know their relation. One of the board members is David Stanley. Uh, his stepbrother is Elvis Presley. Oh, wow. Uh, another one is Tanya Brown. You don't know her name, but you know her sister. Nicole Brown Simpson. So we're getting some people that have contacts that can really help us out and uh, see what we can do to help a whole bunch of other people. That's awesome. Well, I look forward to learning more about Ripple Effect Foundation uh, in the near future, and we'll definitely put links on the show notes page and everything for you. Um, The last question I have for you, Frank, and again, thank you for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. is about the fundraising aspect of uh, creating a nonprofit. I think this is something that scares a lot of people, and even people as entrepreneurs who are just starting out, sometimes they're even scared of asking their customers for a sale or for money because they just don't like the idea or are afraid of asking for money. And as a business owner, you have to believe in your product, of course, and when you do that, it's much easier to ask for the sale. But even then, some people still struggle. As a nonprofit, I can imagine it being a very a very big struggle for some people who don't feel uh, too awesome about making people pull out their wallets. Um, how do you best approach the fundraising aspect of uh, you know running a nonprofit organization? <laughs> and that's a very good question. Uh, and I always tell people, if you're afraid to ask, you shouldn't be in the Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the first thing is you have to have a mission that people will relate to. Mm-hmm. So whatever it may be, helping veterans, it's got to be a mission. Uh, and again, it's got to be a mission of integrity and, and accountability. Um, but you just go there. And you're, the business world is all about sales and the nonprofit is the same thing. It's all about sales. You have to sell that mission to people, and you're going to find the right people to support it. And then it always goes, when I find that right person, how big is your role of that? That you can contact your other friends to see if they believe in that mission I'm doing, just as a a, uh, business will do, how do you believe in my product? Mm -hmm. It's basically the same salesmanship. But if you have a good product in the business world, and you have a good profit in the nonprofit world, and it works the same way. Love it. That's a great answer. And, 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 plus, and plus, you have to show a return. You have to show in the nonprofit world that that money being donated is going to that mission and you're accomplishing mission, just like a business, you're accomplishing a good quality product. 
Absolutely. I think the big struggle with the fundraising aspect in nonprofit world is, you know, a lot of times with the business world, you often get a return immediately after. For example, if you're buying a piece of software or something, or, you know, you're buying a book even, you you get to hold it or start reading it immediately or start using that software and you get that immediate return or that immediate, um, you know, it's a, it's a one-to-one real-time transaction. Whereas if somebody's donating money, often you, you don't really know what happened. So you're, you're hundred percent correct. You're hundred percent correct. And, and like a brand new nonprofit, like ripple effect, we have zero dollars in a bank account right now. Mm-hmm. It will take us a good year uh, to get started when we're actually going to start giving back to the dollars donated. But again, accountability, uh, and the thank you is to show them what's going on in, in the nonprofit world. Here's the money. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, and then you, through your social media sources, keep everybody informed, transparency. Yeah, I love it. Uh, Frank, when, when Ripple Effect starts collecting, let me know. I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to, to help out for sure. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we'll keep that in mind. Is there a website or, or any particular place where people who are listening to this right now can go, or should, is this kind of a... Um... Yeah, the website, the website Ripple Effect is being developed. We, we're, we haven't even got on there yet. Uh, okay. Anything. But for my individual, you can follow my adventures. Uh, we're having a movie made. Uh, Universal Studios is doing a movie about my life, uh, which is kind of flattering. <laughs> but that's a whole other topic, a book coming out. But my personal website is wishman1, the number one, wishman1.com. Wishman1.com. And on that one, one the number one, mm-hmm. not O-N-E. Um, and on that, to be able to follow everything that I'm doing as far as uh, the uh, new Ripple Effect Foundation, the movie, the books, and so on. Man, I'm super inspired. Frank, uh, thank you again so much for coming on and sharing all your wisdom and, and just the inspiration. And I really look forward to these upcoming ventures and the movie and the book. I did, didn't even realize that that was happening. Um, and I, <laughs> I'll definitely make sure to, to, to catch those when they when they come out. If there's anything I or the SPI community can do for you, just please uh, reach out to me and let me know and, and we'll make things happen. Well, Pat, again, I appreciate uh, allowing me the time on your show. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming on. Cheers. All right. All right. I I truly hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I loved re-listening to it and especially recording it and having a conversation with Frank. And it just makes me just so happy that I'm able to connect with people through the podcasting world. I mean, I never thought I would be connecting with some, some of my heroes and even people I didn't know would be my heroes until after I chatted with them like Frank. And I just want to thank you, Frank, if you end up listening to this or if somebody who knows Frank ends up listening to this. Again, Frank Shankwitz, uh, co-founder of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And to everybody else out there who has donated to Make-A-Wish, who has helped or was involved in with Make-A-Wish in some way, shape, or form at any moment in time, just you guys are doing great stuff. And it's so inspirational because I want to do big things to help people like that too. And, you know, I've built a couple schools in Ghana. I'm, I'm, I'm on the advisory board for Pencils of Promise. And uh, the reason for that is not only so I can help out in other ways, but also I just want to make connections with as many of these philanthropic people as possible because this is how we make change in the world. You know, and that, that's why I'm so excited about all of this. So, Frank, you're amazing. Everybody else out there, you're amazing. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoy this episode. A little bit different than other episodes, but also a lot of great content, too. Frank definitely brought the goods, and he has a lot of experience and wisdom to share. So, uh, man, this is great. Hey, really quick, I want to let you know about a page on the website that might be really helpful for you. A lot of you are already taking action on what you've heard on the podcast, which is fantastic, but a lot of you have also messaged me asking for more deeper information, more fine-tuned and highly targeted information for specific problems and pains that you might be having. So what I did was I actually put together a few courses. There's more courses actually coming down the road, uh, but you could check out all the courses and things that are available to you there at smartpassiveincome.com slash courses. My team and I have worked really hard to put together the best information that'll help you solve specific problems that you might be having in your business. So if you're just starting out and you need help and you need accountability, handholding, you want a community behind this as well, check it out. Smartpassiveincome.com slash courses. You can see what's available there. All different kinds of courses to help you through a number of different things you might be working on. And like I said, there are more courses coming down the road too. So one more time, smartpassiveincome.com slash courses. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. And man, I'm really, 
There's just so many great episodes coming up. The next one is with a student of mine who's been on the show before, and he's doing some stuff that I've never heard of before either. So it's sort of the student now teaching the teacher, and uh, you're gonna get a lot of information that's gonna help you, especially if you sort of flatline with sales. If you flatline with sales, this is gonna help you get to the next plateau, and it's gonna be amazing. So I, I look forward to serving you in that episode, episode 221. Uh, until then, just keep pushing the envelope, keep pushing forward, love you guys. Thank you so much for your support, and check out the show notes for this episode at smartpassiveincome.com slash session 220. Take care, see you then. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Hey, and while I got you, you know, I know I normally end the show at this point. However, sometimes I leave special announcements even after John finishes off with his voice over here at the end of the show. And today I wanted to give a special shout out, uh, which I think is very relevant to the topic of this particular episode, to 30 amazing people who during my pre-sale uh, campaign, I guess you could say, for my book, Will It Fly, which was back in February, I had offered certain bonuses depending on the number of books that people purchased. And these people, these 30 amazing people have purchased more than 10 books for giveaways, gifts, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what they did with the books, but I do know that their contribution, not to me and more book sales, but I actually said that, you know what, whatever, if you buy more than 10 books, I'm gonna match how much you pay for your book and write a check in that same amount to pencilsofpromise.org, which is a company, a foundation that is uh, that was founded by Adam Braun back in episode 106. I talked to him, and that's what inspired me to build a couple schools in Ghana and continually trying to support this amazing foundation. I'm on the advisory board, and this is really special to me. So I wanted to just take a moment to actually name off these 30 people. And if you go to smartpassiveincome.com slash session 220, you'll see a list of their names there too and uh, link, links to their websites uh, as well. So I wanna give a big shout out and thanks to Dave Koziel, Mark Mason, Susan Ramson, Bill Gordon, Molly Mahoney, Jeremiah Candelaria, Chris Guzman, Heather Newton, Ryan Grant, Connie Ragan Green, Travis Wilkerson, Samuel Ronkin, Meredith Eisenberg, Julia Darcy, Alton Skinner, Kurt Libby, Kinsey Roberts, Gary Ware, David Hooper, Ronan Beckerman, Karen Joan, Lana Camiel, Victor Miller, John Zenkert, Hank Osborne, Greg Harrington, Paul Potter, Owen Anderson, Matt Lovell, and last but not least, Charlie Cicchetti. Thank you guys, I appreciate you for what you did. I'm so happy to mention your names here and on the website. I highly recommend everybody go and check out their awesome sites and everything they have going on. You can see their names and the name of their websites and their businesses at smartpassiveincome.com slash session 220. Thank you so much, I appreciate you and uh, see you in the next episode. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today's episode and if you're looking for a new podcast to add to your rotation, I highly recommend Problem Solvers, hosted by Jason Pfeiffer, who's been on the show a few times, actually. As you probably heard in the credits, both our shows are on the Entrepreneur Podcast Network. On Problem Solvers, Entrepreneur's Editor-in-Chief tells the stories of real founders that solved real problems in their businesses, helping listeners get through any obstacles in their own ventures. And each episode is really distinct and easy to follow, and they're bite-sized too, usually around 15 to 20 minutes. And Jason pulls each story out himself so you can avoid the same crippling problems. Matt and I were recently on the show in episode 302, and Jason recently hosted a great episode on whether anyone could be too quote-unquote curious for a traditional career. Listen to Problem Solvers right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.